Welcome to the Salesman Podcast, where we interview the world's leading influence, body language, psychology, and sales experts to give you the information you need to close more deals and make more money. Additionally, for sales humor, tutorials, and entertainment, type salesman.red into your browser and come visit the world's largest community of millennial salespeople today. This episode of the Salesman Podcast is sponsored by Salesforce.com. Salesforce.com allows you to sell smarter and faster from anywhere in the world with the world's number one CRM system. Close more deals, get more leads, and make more insightful decisions today by going to salesman.red forward slash Salesforce to get started. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to another episode of the Salesman Podcast. I'm your host, Will Barron, and on today's show, we have Bill Cole, who is the mental game coach. We're discussing how to become resistant to rejection, how to get in the right frame of mind before you make a sales call or do something where you need to be in the zone. And we also touch on meditation, which is something that most people think is a bit wishy-washy and woo-woo and hippie nonsense, but meditation is awesome. We dive into it in the show and we talk about some of the science and some of the benefits for salespeople specifically. Bill is a thought leader in the world of peak performance, coaching and the mental game. He's been profiled on MSNBC, Success Magazine, Huffington Post, the BBC and more. He's coached people at the highest levels of corporate America, at the Olympics, at major pro league sports and he also works with universities and other associations. If you want to know more, go to salesman.red and check out the show notes for this episode there. And with all that said, without further ado, let's jump into today's show. Hi, Bill, and welcome to The Salesman Show. Great to be here, Will. How are you doing? I am good, sir. And you? Fantastic. <laughs> awesome stuff. Well, look, we're going to talk about the mental game of selling, and this is something that fascinates me. And the the first question I want to ask you is, and from all your experience with your uh, consulting and then the books and the audio and everything else that you do at mentalgamecoach.com, how big of a percentage do you think the mental aspect of selling is in what makes a great salesperson? How much of it is process and scripts and following what other people have done and how much of it is the mental side of it? Well, to use a sports analogy, that's a common question asked in sports. The way I answer it is, uh, if you're kind of a beginner in sales, you have no game. You have no Mm -hmm. skills, so you've got to learn everything. So is the mental game important to you? Absolutely. But I have discovered over the years, Will, that as someone advances in their skills and their game is bigger, in sales or sports, uh, the mental game takes a bigger priority. Because at that point, you have your skills well-defined. You understand your process pretty well. you, You know about scripts. You have experience, but the mental game takes on a a much bigger significance. Okay, cool. You've probably got your own points as to certain things within the mental game, but a couple of things I wanted to talk on particularly was becoming resilient to rejection. So I think that's something that really holds beginners back. And then also getting in the zone. I feel like from your experience with the sports side of things, that's going to obviously translate over to sales and being in the flow and in the moment and be able to react to questions and everything in sales meetings. So if we touch on the resilience to rejection first, is this just a case of having people slam down the phone over and over and over and over until you get to the point where you're like, okay, fine, I'm not bothered if someone hangs up on me? Or is there a mental process that people can go through to get to these realizations quicker? Uh, the latter. In other words, uh, traditionally salespeople may learn from volume. A a no leads to a yes, and they use the NEXT situation, which is go to the next call, the next person. And from Mm -hmm. sheer volume, you sort of build up some resilience. It's kind of like toughening your skin. You go out in the backyard, (laughs) start to rake the leaves. Before The first day, you get some calluses on your hand. The second day, it toughens up. And by the third day, your hands are pretty tough, and they can take a lot of work. So pretty similar the way the mind works. The more stress the mind has, the better, as long as the attitude of the person is correct. This is where I would come in. I I can accelerate their ability to have better resilience by getting the right mindset. It's kind of like the proper philosophy of why you're doing sales and how to do sales, which is, you know, every even difficult calls are maybe better for me than easy calls because they're teaching me something. 
Uh, mm-hmm. diff- difficult callers toughen me up more than an easy caller. So actually, maybe in my day today, through my day of sales, I want a good percentage of very difficult callers because maybe at the end of the day, I'll make notes about that. I'll improve as a salesperson. So this is called broadening the issue, which takes the uh, difficult caller that's right in front of you and you put it on a, a bigger scale, which tells you, you know, that kind of nasty prospect or customer that I'm speaking to right now is actually teaching me something. This is good for me. Yep, I'm going to tolerate this. In fact, better than that, I'm going to learn from it. When you say you should be learning from it, should you be, if someone's really negative, should you just, you know, end the call there and be like, look, okay, that's that one wasn't for me? Or should you try and plow through it a little bit to see if they're just putting up barrier to entry, uh, you know, because obviously the important people that and prospects that people are trying to get in, co- in touch with are getting calls all the time. So they're very likely to just throw up a shield at first. Should people be trying to push through that, even if they know they're not going to make a sale, just so that they can practice this rejection? Yeah, there's two angles to that, Will. That would be when you get an objection, you know, there's a book out there called uh, uh, An Objection is a Gift. And that means if, if they're complaining, they're interested. You know, mm-hmm. The only time they're not interested is if you hear click. So if they're, <laughs> if they're complaining to you, that's a good thing because th- those are their concerns, their worries, their anxieties. And maybe people are not very good at communicating these things other than in the form of a complaint. But a good salesperson has to figure this out and take the complaint or the objection and work with it so that the person understands it. And hopefully you put that aside. The second piece is, let's say you get someone who's uh, doing nothing but complaining. Well, maybe you're thinking, uh, I've had quite a few people in the past that have complained, complained, complained. But at the end of it all, at the end of the call, they bought. So that's a common thing, too, where beginners will think, oh, this, this call is going south. This is worthless. I should just hang up. But if you hang in there, it may be that the, the kind of the storm weathers itself out and the person mm-hmm. gets it out of them. Plus, you can answer their objections pretty well. And lo and behold, they like you. Now, there's a third piece to it as well, and that is practice. Let's say it's the worst call you've ever had in your life. They're really um, negative and, and full of everything. You could be thinking to yourself, all right, I think I'm just going to roll with this. I'm going to play this out and see where it goes. Maybe I'm not going to get the sale. In fact, right now, I don't think I'm going to, but I'm going to use this as practice. Here we go. Now, that way, you're getting some value out of that call. And now, the person on the other end of the line doesn't know if you're using it as practice. And again, lo and behold, as if by magic, suddenly the person says, you know, I I like you. I think I'm going to buy from you. Boom. Mm -hmm. That stuff happens all the time. Yeah, I'm of the kind of persuasion that if someone is giving me objections, then that's a, a buying signal. As in, as you said, they wouldn't. They would just hang up the phone if they truly weren't interested. Exactly. And if you push all the way through, and you have some kind of close, whether that be look, this call isn't going great. Let me call you again tomorrow, or let me drop you an email. If you get to that point, they might just be having a bad day, might they? It could be as simple as that. The the dog got run over this morning, and you've called them at the wrong time. Absolutely. That's why it's good to always at the end of a call, even if it's a bad call, quote unquote, ask permission to keep in contact with them. And depending upon the kind of sales you're doing and what you're selling, every product or service has a sales cycle. And if you're selling a very simple thing, the sales cycle might be one phone call. And typically on that phone call, people will buy. This is for lower price kind of things. But if you're selling big ticket items or very complicated things or things that are so complex that there's a lot of educational selling involved. The sales cycle is typically quite lengthy. Some people I know in sales that are selling very big ticket items, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, have a, over a year-long sales cycle. And that means they're never going to get a business closed before about 20 phone calls. It's just the nature of the beast. So you have to know your cycle because there's kind of another thing in sales, the magic number seven, which says, the average customer takes about seven contacts to close. Again, it depends on your industry and what you're selling, but that seven magic numbers is fairly valid. Okay, so how about before the call, Bill? I get pitched all the time from people with usually SaaS and internet services for upgraded salesmen, mm-hmm. and sometimes I pick up the phone like, hi, blah, blah, and they dive into conversation, and it's, it's full of energy, and I get wrapped up in it, even if I'm not interested, Sometimes you get someone who's kind of drab on the phone and you can tell that they're not sold on their own product and they're bored. They're, they're calling you because it's a job, not because they're making commissions and they're excited by it. Mm-hmm. 
what can we do before we even pick up the phone to get ourselves like in the zone, in that state of flow, in that conversational state? And I guess this is going to be similar to what athletes do or speakers do before they go out and perform. Uh, very much so. So there's a few th- key things here. Uh, the, the standard sales advice would be if you're not excited about or about what you're selling, you need to get excited and you need to understand your product or service so well and believe that it is extremely valuable. Then you'll believe in it and your conviction and credibility will, will drip out of your voice across the phone lines. So that's number one. A lot of people really don't believe in what they're selling. They don't think it's that good. So if you don't think it's valuable, you won't be able to get that across to the to the prospect. But two other things would be... Bill, just before sure. we go into the two other things. So it's very easy to say you need to believe and you need to get excited about it. Are there any practical ways to do that? Because some products are... If, you, if you're selling hand dryers for toilets, I don't know why that came into bed as an example, but... That would be, it would be monotonous and boring and you'd be, I don't know, speaking to pub landlords and obviously there's, the motivation is for salespeople, 99% of the time is always going to be that commission check at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Uh, as long as like, you're, you know, your product's ethical and safe and all that, then it, you should be happy and excited to make money from it. But what can you do from a mindset perspective if you're just not excited about it? Well, it's funny you should mention that because selling hair dryers is one of my favorite hobbies, Will, and I'll be doing that later today. But getting back to the question, <laughs> uh, I think there's a little formula I like to use, which is uh, called goal and then meaning. So let's say you are selling these hair dryers. Now, maybe you could sit down with a little uh, a pen and paper and think, okay, now what, what, what advantages or improvements could my prospects get from having this hair dryer? How could their lives actually be better? Uh, could their mm-hmm. lives be more meaningful? Uh, what, how would their lives change? And um, so your goal is to sell, but the meaning would, would be uh, what, what's the significance in it for them? Now, if you can come up with those things in a bona fide way, you have something. Aside from that, you just have to get excited maybe about yourself. Maybe you're not excited about the product, but you are excited about you selling and what you're going to get out of it. And uh, mm-hmm. that would be, okay, here are my goals for selling this many, this amount, by this amount of date. And then it's good also to use that meaning formula, which is, now, what would that mean for me? Well, let's see. If I sell this amount, I'll be able to buy such and such. If I sell that amount, I'll be able to buy such and such for my family. And if I get to this amount, I'll be able to take a trip with my family that they've really been wanting for a long time. Okay, now I'm motivated. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like having a reason to sell other than just to sell. I guess by doing that, you're almost turning it into a game. And this is what I used to do, just have... Um, a spreadsheet which I print out. So I used to be medical device sales, and it'd be so many hundred thousand pound because the targets were like millions for the the products that we were selling. So many hundred thousand pound, and I'm going to buy myself this, or this will mean that I get to actually go on holiday this year, or this and this and this. So yeah, I'm totally on board with that. Exactly. And now the other piece you asked about: how, how does a top athlete prepare for a competition? I'll tell you a very short story. A couple of years ago, when we had the Olympics in London. Uh, I was uh, coaching at the Olympics every day, but I wasn't in London. I was over here doing FaceTime with uh, one of my athletes who was at the Olympics, and he was a top uh, American diver. He won the U.S. Olympic trials over here, and he was over at the Olympics for the first time. And uh, talked to him every day uh, two weeks before the Olympics and getting him prepared and everything, the right mindset. And people always wonder, well, you told me this story before, Bill, and you you said he's like a multiple – world champion and, and many, many national champions. So why does a guy like that need someone like you to help him prepare? He should be uber confident. True, but it was his first Olympics. And uh, the old expression is just because you're, you're, you're world class doesn't mean you don't need a coach because they want to keep improving too and they don't want to go down. So mm-hmm. And they can always improve in their mental approach. So I uh, kept working him out every day. He was very nervous, uh, very apprehensive, really worried. Of course, on a big stage like that, who wants to mess up? Answer, nobody. <laughs> so that's the anxiety. And uh, then about a day or so before the Olympics, I FaceTime him and uh, I say, wow, you, you look different. You look uh, relieved. He says, yeah, I think I'm at peace now because uh, I, I've got it in perspective. You know, all I can do is go out there and control what I can control. And that's my thinking, my pictures in my head, my breathing, my muscles, my routine, the focus funnel. That's all I can do. 
I can't control the other competitors. I can't control the judges. So that gave me peace of mind to realize that I can control me and I'll let the rest go. And he went out there and relaxed and did very well and ended up winning bronze. So that's a story that I think a lot of salespeople could use as well. You really only can control you. You can't control the prospect or the customer. Yes, you can influence them, but there's a difference there. You also mm. cannot control all the other peripherals. So now coming back to focus funnel, if you uh, open the bonnet of your car, I hope I have the term right. Uh, is that the front of the car in England or the back? Uh, the front. Okay, I got it right. And uh, you're going to put some oil in. You pull out the trusty uh, funnel. You unscrew the top. You put in the funnel, and you start pouring the oil. So everybody has a picture of what a funnel is like. Now, if you take that funnel and you point it uh, sideways, you have a point and an open end. And the point represents the start of your phone call as a salesman or a salesperson. The broad funnel represents your entire life, friends, family, uh, everything you do, hobbies, the whole thing. And let's say you're getting ready to make a phone call. Well, uh, you're 10 minutes away from the phone call. Maybe what you do as you walk down the funnel, we're using that metaphorically, is you're getting your sales game face on. You're either getting more serious or you're reading your script or you're thinking about how you're going to open or you're getting your mindset or you're relaxing your muscles or maybe you're meditating, whatever it is you do. But you're getting more and more down the funnel where your whole world becomes you and that phone call and the prospect. And that helps you block everything else out, all the extracurriculars that are irrelevant, and get you tuned into what you have to do. And a few minutes later, we can talk about other things you add in there. But I think you get the idea that the focus funnel is the pathway or the ritual or the process that you use to mentally prepare for any given call. Make sense so far? Yeah, perfectly. I love the way you mentioned meditation then. So from a sport perspective and, and even a science perspective, there's loads of studies that show the benefits of it. But every time I've spoke about meditation in previous companies I've worked at, it's always seen as a massive hippie woo-woo kind of thing. But I think salespeople are under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure and they've got to perform at a high level over long periods of time. And I think meditation is a massive tool for them that is always, uh, not always, but is quite often just passed aside as something that's mm -hmm. just really hippie and bs -y. Is this some meditation something that you work on with your athletes and the salespeople that you coach? Both. And whenever I teach meditation well, I'm very careful to get rid of my tie-dye shirt beads and the incense <laughs> the other way. So, uh, but you're exactly right. It does have the woo-woo thing. And the way I describe it is um, this is a, a little simple exercise. I, I can describe it here to the listeners. Simple exercise you do for a minute or less or longer if you choose that will simply clear your mind out. It will relax your muscles. It controls your mind where you want it to go. A little mm -hmm. aside, uh, almost every salesperson I work with has a little touch of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADH, whatever, or ADD, which means their mind is very jumpy, more than the average person. So I don't know why uh, that's true for salespeople, but uh, it is. So let's say even the, the average person not in sales uh, has a mind which we term the monkey mind. And we call it that because just the natural state of our human mind is it likes to jump all over the place, like from tree branch to tree branch, and it doesn't like to settle down. However, before a phone call or a face-to-face -face sales encounter, you need to walk through that sales funnel, and some form of meditation should be part of it because if you do the meditation, you'll, you'll t tame down the monkey mind, you'll get your game face on, you'll get the proper mindset, you'll relax, and you'll start to get into the zone. So one word about the zone. Uh, the zone is something that in sports and, and performance endeavors, you can witness someone being in the zone and everyone and points and says, wow, he or she is really clicking. Look at that. I, you can tell what they're doing is really different and very premium. Yeah, that's right. You can see it. Now, if you were to ask the performer what's it like, uh, what it was like after the performance, they would say a few things like, well, my mind was clear. I was relaxed. I was in the moment. Very enjoyable very much in control, but paradoxically not forcing things. I just kind of let it happen. I didn't have to remember what to do. It just came automatically. It was like I was an automatic pilot. Boy, it was great. So there's a pretty quick description of the zone for athletes or any performer, and that's exactly what we want to get into as a sales athlete, if you will. 
And this meditation exactly helps you basically form in, inside yourself a little climate or environment that uh, kind of triggers the outward zone. So sometimes that internal environment will, they call the IPS, the ideal performance state. And basically it's what I just described. Relax a little bit, clear your mind out a little bit, calm down the emotions and kind of become an empty vessel to through which you can put your sales message. Also, you can listen and be present with the client or the customer or the prospect much better than having your monkey mind jump all over the place. So does that give you a yeah. little snapshot? Yeah. So here's how the meditation works. So there's a lot of different forms of it. Sometimes I don't even call it meditation to avoid the woo-woo. I might say, all right, let's do a little mind clearing technique. Let me do a little thing called centering. Let's do something that'll help you focus. And for salespeople, they say, yeah, great, sounds good. So it kind of goes like this. You can be seated and be in a comfortable chair, ideally. Your eyes are open. You're looking at maybe something across the room that's interesting, a knick-knack on your shelf or a painting or a photograph. And you basically just stare at it. And you could also be in your car getting ready to go into the prospect's office. Um, but you, you want to stare at something. That kind of controls your mind at the start. The next thing you do is you note how you're seated. There's no right or wrong other than being relaxed. But you want to note how you're sitting. Are you, are you reclining? Are you upright? Whatever. The next thing, I, I do this a lot slower when I take them through it. I'm going a little quicker mm -hmm. now for the il illustration purpose. The next thing is, all right, let's get your sense of touch going. Right now, you're already listening to me. That's the, that's the hearing channel. You have the visual channel going. You're looking at the knickknack on your shelf. Thirdly, you have the sense of your body position. And fourthly, now you have your sense of touch. So take your fingertips and run them along your desk or your chair. Now do it on the seating area. Now do it on your clothing. And you notice now your fingertips are kind of tuned into different text, uh, context. Now, lastly, I would have the person focus on their breath. And that would be the following. Okay, uh, focus on your breathing without controlling it. Listen to it, feel it. Go ahead and take a deep breath. And if I'm in the office with them or on Skype on a phone call, I say, good, I can see that your chest is rising and falling, your gut is going in and out, your shoulders are rising. So we call that the mechanism of breathing, and you can feel it. So now all these things, the sight, the sound, the touch, the body sense, the breathing, all these things are sense-based, and what we call that will is sensate, and that means now the person is more sensory oriented, which again, coming back to the IPS, is exactly the internal climate that they are creating within themselves, the calmness, the focus, the clear mind. And that would trigger, therefore, the actual zone between them and the customer. But it all begins inside the salesperson themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love it, Bill. Love it. And everyone will have had those meetings have just gone perfectly and you've been really quick on your feet and everyone will have had those meetings where perhaps you've had a busy horrible journey over and there's been traffic and you you're worried about being late and you go in and then the whole thing is just a shambles from start to finish and i think doing exactly what you just said then would put people on the best foot for pretty much any sales call or sales meeting i think that's that's a really useful tool that you shared with the audience yeah, it's, it's one I use all the time. And, you know, there, there's kind of a knock on salespeople, which is they're great talkers, but maybe they're not the world's greatest listeners. We don't know why that is necessarily, but it, it may hold true somewhat. Part of it is, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, mo many salespeople are really tuned into their script, whether it's, you know, in their head or they have something written down. And they're also very much into controlling the conversation so they can steer it in the direction towards a yes and ultimately a sale. But the problem with that is if you're up in your head thinking of your script or you're up in your head thinking of how you're going to control everything, you're not actually present very well with the prospect or the customer. And unfortunately, they can sense that. So this little pre-zone kind of a thing, the meditation exercise, will help you. You, you remember your script and you know where you want to go, but it won't be in a forcing, effortful way. It'll be in a more natural, organic way where when you're in front of that other human being, you're going to be more fully present and much more able to listen to them. And they will get a sense that you are there with, indeed with them and mm -hmm. can respond better to them. And then, of course, that builds the rapport. It builds the connection. And before you know it, you're, you've got a really authentic meeting with another human being, and they think you're not just a salesperson trying to get over on them. They think you actually are trying to help. For sure, for sure. And that's the biggest problem I see with people who are new to sales in that, 
they're just pitching, 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 pitching. They go for some kind of close, which is written down, rather than in reality, their job is to the to to give a solution to the prospect. Coming on from that, then, what do you think is the one thing that holds people back and sales people back specifically in the in their job when they're dealing with people when they first start out? Probably number one is the fear of rejection, and what's mm-hmm. involved in that is the the fear of looking stupid or being embarrassed or getting attacked verbally by the prospect, uh, or having to hear the no and then kind of skulk out of the office with your tail between your legs. And if you if you have a sales manager, if you don't own your own business, or a boss, you have to report to the boss that you quote-unquote failed. And people don't relish failure. But So this is really the number one thing that the beginning and really the veteran salesperson has to master is the art of not taking rejection personally, and building up a, a kind of a callus, as we mentioned, or a mental toughness boundary around them where they are willing to hear many no's and many objections and hear a lot of negativity, but keep pressing on with a very healthy, happy outlook so that they can sell to the next person. So that, that really is the number one difficulty and the number one challenge that I, I help people with in sales. And how do you go about that then? So you, you touched on a couple of things, but is it a case of get into people's head that you're not taking it personally because you're they're not necessarily rejecting you as a person they're rejecting either your product or your pitch or the overall solution isn't right or the, what what do you do what's the first thing you do if if you notice someone was having that problem uh what you said is exactly correct it means uh you want to help the person understand that sometimes a no or a rejection is not a personal thing at all and I would suggest to the listeners, make a list of all the p- potential reasons someone could say no to you or not be interested in your product. And you said you started off with a few, which would be uh, wrong time of day to call. They're busy. They're distracted. Uh, they don't have the money. They just made a giant purchase of something else. They currently don't have a need for it right now. Or they just got off the phone with an- another salesman who rubbed them the wrong way, and you're the next one. And you could go on, on and on and on for all the reasons why you might be rejected or have the no. And then the next thing I would have them do is we're going to use our funnel thing again. And you've probably heard this one. But now we take our funnel and we point it uh, with the pointy part down and the open part of the top. And this is called the sales funnel. And we talk about the number of contacts you have to make a day to get an appointment. So let's say you're selling a bigger ticket item and you don't close it over the phone. It has to be in person, and you have either email or phone contacts you make with somebody, and you've discovered, or maybe your sales manager told you, that it takes about 15 uh, contacts to get one actual appointment. So that means you've got to make X number a day to get two appointments. And that, then you discovered out of every 10 appointments you make, that you'll make two sales. So now you know you've got to make X appointments a week to get to the sales target you want, and this is really describing how sales is a numbers game. So the, the phrase we put to it is, keep your sales funnel full. And that will reduce a lot of worry about the negativity you get over the phone or the rejection because you say, well, that's only number five for today. I have seven more to go before I get my appointment. Yeah, I, so I wrote this down. I wanted to come back to this. I'm glad you brought it up. And I wrote down when you were talking before about understand that you can only control what you can control. People who are getting, or what I find, just salespeople who are getting really stressy about needing to close this deal or this cl- deal is so important, it's purely because they've not got enough prospects in their pipeline from the the top down. If you've got enough in there and you can play it as a numbers game, it doesn't. It's important that you close everything that you can, but if someone isn't ready, there's no need to get stressed about it because you know it's going to happen later on further down the line. Uh, you said it exactly right on the money because uh, that's probably the main reason uh, n- younger and maybe even some experienced salespeople get in trouble. I always ask them, how's your sales funnel? And they kind of hem and haw as well. Not as big as <laughs> well, that. That puts undue pressure on you because if you only have a few possible sales, you feel like you must absolutely close. But if you have a wealth of possibilities, then you simply go NEXT and you move on to the next one, instead of fighting the prospect or trying to overly convince them, I don't say you give up, but you don't beat your head against the wall. Uh, you just move on. 
Yeah, well, you, you just prioritize them, don't you? And then go after the ones that are going to close quickest that are of the highest value. It's as simple as that. Very much so. There's an old joke about the salesperson. He's beating his head against the wall in an alley, and his sales manager comes up and says, why are you beating your head against the wall? And the salesman says, it feels so good when I stop. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Well, Bill, I've got one final question for you, just before you tell us a little bit more about mentalgamecoach.com and what you've got going on there. And that is, who do you think the world's best salesperson is? And they don't have to be labeled as a salesperson. They, they could be anyone. Wow. The first thing that comes to mind, Will, would be uh, any child under the age of 18. <laughs> Because if they want something from mom and dad, they know how to work them big time. For sure. If they don't get it from mom, they go to dad. Of course, they always say, oh, dad already said yes. And mom says, okay, you can do it. Yeah, kids are great at, at convincing and selling and, and, uh, and vaguely in their way into what they want to get. Um, I, I'd have to say kids. Amazing stuff. Well, Bill, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what's at mentalgamecoach.com and your books and your audio? Appreciate it, Will. Well, at, at uh, mentalgamecoach.com, I have a um, consultancy that deals with uh, coaching and consulting, training and speaking in different categories, uh, sales, executive coaching, business coaching, sports psychology coaching, interview coaching, um, and presentation coaching. So you notice they all kind of revolve around performance. So I've been a peak performance coach for over 35 years, and I've evolved into uh, my system as applied to those different disciplines. I do have some audios and some books that people can take advantage of. And uh, probably over 80 or 90, I have kind of lost count, but 80 or 90 free articles on a variety of topics on peak performance and all those disciplines I talked about, all for free at mentalgamecoach.com. Amazing stuff. Well, with that said, Bill, I just want to thank you again for your time today. Really appreciate it. I've got a lot out of it and I know the audience will have as well. And I want to thank you for coming on the Salesman Show. Well, it's been my pleasure. I'm glad to come back anytime. 